on today's show, a bit of widely unknown outdoor education. We explore the state park U.S. presidents used as their private getaway. Can you name it? We visit with our winged friends of winter. And these young anglers teach adults how to fish. They're known as the Whiz Kids. Minnesota Bound, presented by Connecticut Water Treatment Systems. Hi everybody, Bill and I welcome you to Minnesota Bound. Up first, a story about a park. Long ago, it was named after one of Ireland's most beautiful valleys. I bet you didn't know that Glendalough State Park was a playground for the rich and sometimes very famous. <music> I'm Jeff Wiersma. I'm the park manager here at Glendalough State Park. This is my 21st year here. Uh, I've been here since the campground opened in 1998. The park is uh, just under 2,000 acres of land and probably another about 1,000 acres of water. It can actually be quite busy this time of year. We get lots of cross-country skiers and the snowshoers, which are ever increasing every year. This is my dog, Gus. We're uh, out to get a little exercise. When you're walking, you just hear the snow crunching and uh, you don't hear a single car or any traffic. The camper cabins and the yurts are full most weekends. In the winter, they're heated with a wood stove. If you're in a yurt, you're hearing everything. You're hearing the owls at night. You're hearing the coyotes howling. You get to hear all those nature noises while you're in the yurt. It's pretty nice and peaceful. But you do have to go a ways to get there. It's a two mile hike. Uh, we do pack a trail so they can walk it. The lake's still there. Maybe halfway. We get a clientele with the uh, carding camping and stuff that can't be beat. That was one of the major features that led to this becoming a state park was we had so much pristine shoreline and especially Annie Battle Lake. Annie Battle Lake is entirely contained within the park, uh, but we also have shoreline, Lake Emma, Blanche Lake, Sunset Lake is entirely in the park. Winter, when you, uh, we don't allow power augers on any battle lakes. It's the definition of fishing blindly. The Heritage uh, Lake uh, refers to uh, special regulations that don't allow any types of motors on the lake, not even elect electric motors. Uh, you can't use uh, cameras or fish finders or even you're not supposed to use GPS. The idea was to create a fishing experience that was similar to what it would have been like a hundred years ago. Glendalo was once owned by the Minneapolis uh, Star Tribune. It was uh, purchased by the owner of the Tribune in 1928 by uh, Frederick Murphy. He and his wife were Irish and so it was named after the Glendalough in Ireland. Uh, this was a hunting camp down here uh, during the fall. The Star Tribune would invite lots of their advertisers here for a weekend to go uh, pheasant hunting. That was people like uh, the presidents of United Airlines, Procter & Gamble, real influential people would come uh, in, here in the fall. Some pictures of like. A lot of times in the summer it was just for the family. Family would come here around the 4th of July and they would stay until about Labor Day. It's amazing when you go through the buildings and read all the history of the presidents and, and visitors they've had here. 
growing up, I, I did work out at the park a little bit when they had the pheasants and ducks. Well, the deer, uh, at one time, there was 70 acres that were fenced in. There was a uh, pretty much a fairly tame deer herd here. The deer were like pets, and they, they still are to some extent. They are a, a big attraction. People love to come in and see the deer. You can actually hear the birds are quite active right now, and it's a great park for, for birding. Uh, we have a lot of birds here that stay all winter, take advantage of the creek being open all winter. The Lendolo just kind of grows on you. There's nothing like it anywhere else in the state. Minnesota Bound is brought to you by Connecticut Water Treatment Systems, Strike Master. Star Bank, and by Ice Castle Fish Houses. Up next, a story about our feathered friends who stick around all winter long. Ron Shera has the story. If there's a pecking order among folks who feed winter birds, this fella rules the roost. Carol Henderson knows all about bird seeds. This is a buyer beware situation where there are lots of different alternatives for bird food, but there's a lot of it out there that the birds don't like. It's like putting out bread for the birds. That's not very nutritious and it's the wrong thing to do. He also knows how to write bird feeding books. Two books on bird feeding. One of them is Wild About Birds, the DNR Bird Feeding Guide, and that's been incredibly popular. Sold almost 100,000 copies. 100,000 copies? Yeah, and it's been used not just in Minnesota, but all over the country as a guide because it goes through all the different possibilities for what birds come to the feeders, what kind of feeds to use, and then it has 26 different designs on how you can build your own bird feeders. Henderson, the retired head of DNR's non-game program, has written 13 bird books, including five titles published by the DNR. I think the state has received probably over a quarter million dollars in royalties on my books over the years. More proof that it's a very popular pastime, backyard winter bird feeding. And of course the squirrels, they always invite themselves too. <laughs> most of the birds that come to your backyard feeder are the most adaptable birds. Henderson says, while our handouts may make winter survival easier, our charitable food shelf is more about our own enjoyment. In studies that have been done on birds, even like the chickadee, which is one of the most common birds at feeders, not more than 20% of their food comes from feeders. The rest of it all comes from wild sources. So we may think we're saving them from starvation, but birds are very resourceful. And, and in many ways, at bird feeders, they're nomadic. They go from yard to yard. They go where the food is. When it runs out somewhere, they're not going sit, to sit there and starve. They go find somewhere else. One key to successful bird feeding is dishing out the right stuff. I found out that if you buy quality bird mixes with the quality foods, you're going to get the quality birds. Black oil sunflowers, safflower, white safflower, or now the new kind of safflower called Nutrisaf, or what I call golden saf, wonderful stuff. A complete bird feeding station also offers suet. Suet it attracts a lot of birds that maybe, maybe won't go to the black oil sunflowers. Lately, Henderson has been feeding birds an uncommon farm-grown seed in use a century ago. What I've got here is industrial hemp. And this is the kind of hemp that was grown by farmers back in World War II. Uh, they were raising it at that time for fiber for making rope for the war effort. And uh, it's not gonna make the birds loopy. In my own backyard, my feathered neighbors are offered cardinal mix, black sunflower seeds, a dash of hemp seed, and a chunk of beef suet. Birds are just so enjoyable in so many ways. For sure. If the winter birds seem happy outside at my bird feeders, I'm happy to be inside watching. 
Still ahead, we peek in on a Minnesota winter tradition. But first, the story of kids who certainly know how to fish. Closed captioning is brought to you by Cast Lake Chain of Resorts. Up next, Travis Frank hits the ice with a group of young anglers who like roles reversed. You know, they become the teachers and the adults, well, you get it. For generations, adults have been teaching young children how to catch fish. I've always wondered, what would happen if the roles were reversed? Would you rather catch a hundred fish or one fish? A hundred fish. Would you rather catch one big fish or a hundred little fish? A hundred little fish. One big, fish. One, big. One, big one. one. one big one. When the baby fish is born, what are they called? Minnows. Fishlets. Fishlets? When a baby fish is born, they're called a fry. French fries. They're called French fries. They're called French fries. How many babies do fish have? Probably like five. Ten. Four. Four, Myla? Five. Five? Did you know that fish can have a couple hundred thousand babies? I was actually gonna say 290. 290? How did the lake freeze? Because it got cold. How cold does it have to get to freeze? So cold. Do you know? 70. 70? Maybe 90. Interesting. Negative 10. Yep, that'll do. Negative 5. Negative five. You guys like those goldfish, huh? What is it called when there's a whole bunch of fish swimming together? Myla, do you know? No. Pack. Weston. School. Ooh, good. That's what I was gonna say. That's what you were gonna say? How old do you have to be to catch a fish? Maybe four or five. Two. Two? Cause, yeah, because I've been fishing since I was two. How old is too old to fish? Kingston. A hundred. Ooh, cash. 290. 290? How long do you plan on fishing? Maybe nine. Nine? Myla? I think when I, when I'm probably a grandma. When you're a grandma? Mm hmm Evan? Uh, wait, what was the question? What's your favorite fish to catch? Cash. What? You've caught muskies before? I haven't caught one, but it's still my favorite thing to catch. Okay. What is the best fish to eat? Muskie. Have you eaten a muskie? Not yet, but I still know. Okay. Uh, Who taught you how to fish? Yes, Myla. Grandpa taught me how to fish. Evan, who taught you how to fish? Myself. Are you a better fisherman than your dad? He said he's, I'm the best fisherman he knows. What are those? Black worms. Black worms. What Fish. eats that? Funnies and crappies. Does anybody wonder what that tastes like? No. Yeah. Cash, you think I should eat that one? Has anybody ever lost a fish? What did that make you feel like? I was like, oh. Who's the best fisherman here? Me. Me. Let's prove it. Let's find out. Let's do it. I'm not. You're not? How do you know that? Because his tummy is a little wider. Good job. Ooh, that's a nice one. Whoa. That's a keeper, huh? Yeah. Good job. Thanks. Got him. Ooh, that's a big one. Ooh. Ooh, that's pretty good size. Wait, you got one? Nope. Ooh, I get yes, I do. <laughs> is that a keeper? Yep. You got him. Set the hook. Ooh. Yep. Oh. He's a fighter. Ooh. Oh, you want to kiss it? No. Oh, I can't, I can't, I can't. Oh. Bye. 
big smile. It's clear the future of fishing remains in good hands. Everybody hold all the fish right here. With or without a little bit lower adult supervision. You like to fish? Is fishing cool? Yeah! Minnesota Bound is brought to you by Treasure Island Resort and Casino, Hewitt Docks Lifts and Pontoon Lakes, and by Totem Resorts, the premier destination for world-class fishing. Up next, we're headed north to discover the lure of spearing. Yeah, a Minnesota tradition still celebrated at a place called Heath's Resort. Come the dead of winter, many Minnesota resorts grind to a cold, frozen halt. Heath's would not be one of them. David Heath and Copper work all week long, a three-generation family business made of ice. This is our 75th, 75th year. Um, started by my grandfather in 1938. David and his dad use simple tools. We don't use that, that new electronic stuff, just a string and a weight. We do it like we used to do it. Simple means to a cold, wet end. Cutting holes in Minnesota's whitefish chain of lakes and then covering them up with old school dark houses, the stuff Minnesota spearfish tails are made of. See, the Heath family has been setting spear houses since World War II. That's my grandpa there, and that's my dad. It's the old Minnesota winter tradition, spearing northern pike, a tradition shared way back by families, including one with a pretty famous name. The last started coming up with his dad spearing when he was a boy. Les Kuba, arguably Minnesota's most recognized wildlife artist. One day I was sitting down on the bank down in front looking over the beach, sitting there talking to Les, and he said he wanted to do a dark house spearing print. My dad took a northern this stuff down in our office. Dad stuck it underneath the hole like this, and I stood up on top of the seat and took a picture of it. And that's, where, that's how Les painted the first dark house spearing painting. Cuba would go on to paint a series of three, all based on Heath's resort. Now, famous Minnesota prints. See, he's got LK on the, on the thermos, Les Cuba. You'll notice in the first painting a tin of tobacco. Then look in the second there. That tin finds its way to the bottom of the lake. Oh, <laughs> and look closely at the third painting. You can see that they, the, you clean the hole up, see the Van Camp's can and the Prince Albert can have spear holes in them. So he speared the garbage off the lake before he left. Uh, they're pretty cool. Even now, people come for the novelty of Heath's spear houses, which is why David's up before the sun. Don't need to go home. <laughs> Along with Copper. After breakfast, David shuttles his clients. Nancy Canterbury's family comes every winter. You know, for me, it's listening to the fire, sitting quietly, meditating, really, as you study the floor. Mine is spearing fish and eating them. That's, your, yeah. that's the appeal for you. Yeah. Uh, I like the quiet, he likes the action. Chad Haney comes for his own reasons. The adrenaline rush. Really? When you see the northern start coming in towards your decoy, and it's the luck of the draw trying to actually get it. Put a visit to Heath on your bucket list. If you've never tried spearing, do it at least once. Watching a watery world wide awake below the ice is truly one of Minnesota's finer winter traditions. Pickled pike in a jar. You've had it? I have. In fact, I'll make you a jug the next time I get a few pipes. Sounds delicious. <laughs> well, that about does it for us. We'll see you back here next week. In the meantime, don't forget to introduce a kid to the great outdoors.
transportation provided by Premier Transportation. Call 1-800-899-7433.